Carolyn Rye, Chair of the School Board of the City of Virginia Beach, and I hereby call this meeting to order at 6 o'clock p.m. on this 11th day of October 2022. Members of the public, as always, will be able to observe this meeting through live streaming on vbschools.com, broadcast on VBTV Channel 47, and on Zoom. We welcome all those present with us here in person this evening. And with that, Madam Clerk, would you please announce those school board members in attendance? Thank you, Madam Chair. Present in school board chambers are Chairwoman Rye, Ms. Vice Chair Melnick, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Felton, Ms. Manning, Ms. Owens, Ms. Riggs, and Ms. Weems. Thank you. And we have uh, Ms. Uh, Jennifer's first name. I went. Mrs. Franklin is, is away out of state on business. Uh, Mrs. Holtz is absent due to health reasons and, and Mrs. Hughes uh, due to illness. And maybe zooming in. We'll, okay. Ms. Hughes is not online yet. Okay. So I now ask those present to all join us in a moment of silence. And please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I say, with no awards or recognitions this evening, uh, we'll go straight to adoption of the agenda. Are there any modifications to the agenda? Hearing none, a motion to approve? Mrs. Uh, Anderson and a second, Mrs. Manning. All in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Hughes, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. We have um, eight ayes and the motion passed. Thank you. And with no superintendent um, report. Sorry, we have nine ayes, the motion passed. Thank you. With no superintendent report this evening, we will proceed to approval of meeting minutes from the September 22nd, 2022 regular school board meeting. Are there any modifications to the minutes? Okay. Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second, Mrs. Weems. All in favor, show a raised hand, please. Ms. Hughes, how do you vote? I vote yes. Thank you, Madam Chair, we have nine ayes. The motion passed. Thank you. All right, so that brings us to the public comment portion of the meeting. And the school board will now hear public comment on matters relevant to pre-K to 12 public education in Virginia Beach and the business of the school board and the school division from citizens and delegations who signed up with the school board clerk prior to noon today. Speakers are responsible for being in chambers or online when they're called to speak, and if not present, at that time, the school board at its discretion may allow the speaker to speak at the end of the public comment session. The school board always invites the public to submit comments through our group email account, which can be found on our website. So Madam Clerk, would you first introduce the first speaker of the evening? Thank you, Madam Chair. We have Emily Labar, then Alexander Estrot, then Joey Coley. Good evening. Good evening. Can you hear me? My name is Emily Labar, and I'm a senior at First Colonial High School and the president of our Gender Sexuality Alliance. Last time I was here, I spoke about moral obligation and your role as school board members to protect your students. The time is always right to do what is right, but to 
but today doing what is right is even more pressing. The 2022 model guidelines, if enacted, endanger the rights of our transgender students. Every student, every person deserves to be treated with respect and compassion. Earlier this year, there was a case concerning the mask mandate ban, where the issue before the court was whether Governor Yunkin, through his emergency powers, can override the decision of local school boards. Judge Di Matteo in Arlington, Virginia, ruled in favor of the school boards, indicating that Yunkin could not override the decision of those districts. This school board, just as it did when deciding not to enforce Yunkin's mask mandate ban in K through 12 schools, has the ability to do what is right and protect its students. A name a child chooses to go by or their preferred pronouns do not fundamentally alter the way that child is raised. No matter what name they go by, no matter whether it's safe for them to be out of the closet, they're the same person. And if respecting their chosen name and their preferred pronouns saves them from becoming a statistic, if it saves them from becoming one of the truly staggering number of transgender students who consider suicide, then why wouldn't we call them by that name? This proposed method of requiring paperwork to call a student by a nickname or a chosen new name is dangerous for some students. It risks physical violence and it risks students being kicked out of their homes. A study published in 2019 in the American Academy of Pediatrics showed that 30% of youth in, in the foster care system aged 10 to 18 are a part of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm asking you to keep our transgender students safe. There's a precedent 30 seconds. for not enforcing these new policies. The Richmond School Board voted to approve the RPS Transgender Student Protection Resolution, which rejected the 2022 model guidelines. The Alexandria Public School Board then followed their lead. Cities and counties throughout Virginia are choosing to be on the right side of history, a choice that is now yours to make. Thank you. Our next speaker is Alexander Estrault. Joey Coley, and then Savannah Newell. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Alex Elsher, and I'm a senior at First Columbia High School. I am here along with many of my classmates to voice my opposition to the Virginia Department of Education's proposed policy on transgender students and to ask you to do the same. The reason that I am here, not many of my trans or LGBTQ plus friends, is not that they do not share my passion. It is that it's rather that their parents will not allow them to come here and stand for their own rights. These are the same parents that this state believes should be mandated to be told their, gen their child's gender identity by our school systems. Many of these students would be thrown onto the streets with no support and no care for living their true identity and coming out to their parents. Yet the Virginia Department of Education wants us to mandate them to make a choice between their home lives and their school lives. This is not a choice any child should have to make. Our children should be able to go to school feeling safe around their teachers, counselors, and classmates, and not worry that they will make a wrong move and be forced to make this horrible decision. The Rockingham County, a county that Trump got 70% of the vote in in 2020, showed the courage to act and to not enforce their policy in the, their schools. There is no excuse for Virginia Beach not to act and for to allow this policy to maintain place in our schools. I would like to end this by saying that I am not what many people would call a progressive. I have supported a majority of what Governor Glenn Youngkin has done in office. However, before I call myself a conservative or Republican, I call some myself a friend and a human. This, this is not a political issue. This is a human rights issue. This is an issue of compassion and dignity for our trans and LGBTQ students in our schools. And earlier, I mentioned choices. Well, this school board has a choice to make. This board can choose an action and decide to bend the knee to the state and allow for the rights of trans kids to be trampled upon and disrespected. Or this board can choose compassion, and make their own policy, enshrining the rights of trans students in our schools and ensuring that our schools are safe places for all students to be themselves 
and live their true identities without having to live in fear of their own teachers and parents. I am asking you to choose compassion. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joey Colley, Savannah Newell, and then Icarus Landacker. Okay, then you go ahead and we'll, if he's here by the end of the session, we'll allow him to speak. So welcome to you. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Savannah Newell and I am a student at First Colonial High. Without advocacy, vulnerable people cannot be heard or given credence. They cannot be supported, protected, or defended and their rights will be lost. Without advocacy, vulnerable people have no power and will be invisible. At First Colonial, every student has been taught how to advocate for not just themselves, but for others as well. We are taught that we must use our voice to protect and promote our rights. This is why I am here today. I am here to protect our transgender and non-binary students' rights. I am here to lend my voice to the vulnerable so that they aren't invisible. Data from the National Library of Medicine indicates that 86% of transgender and non-binary students have considered suicide, with 56% of those students having already attempted suicide. However, LGBTQ students who had access to supportive programs at school reported significantly lower suicide rates than those who did not. So why does Virginia's proposal require teachers and school staff to forcibly out students to their parents? Why does it require parental approval for a student to go by a different name use different pronouns, or even go by a nickname. It is due to a misunderstanding of trans students and will ultimately cause further harm and isolation in our school system. The policy will not protect our transgender and non-binary students as it claims it will. The Trevor Project's 2022 national survey shows that transgender and non-binary students with no access to an LGBT LGBTQ affirming school report higher rates of suicide. This model of a policy endangers lives. It takes absolutely no money or time to show respect towards someone by using their preferred name and pronouns, yet it will, save, it will save countless lives. However, it is not just in my hands, it is also in yours. As seen in Richmond Public Schools, the school board may refuse to follow the policy, especially since the proposed policies remove protections for transgender and non-binary students in Virginia public schools and stigmatize and undermine their dignity. I beg you to follow in the footsteps of Richmond Public Schools and reject the policy. You have stood up to overreaching policies before during COVID when you refused to impose the mask mandate ban. Now, I am asking you to stand up once again. Stand up for your transgender and non-binary students. Fight for them. 30 listen, seconds. Listen to the voice of the students. Take note of the hundreds of students who walked out in protest. Take note of everyone here today speaking out against this policy. Listen to us, hear us, and please, I'm begging you, protect us. Thank you. Our next speaker is Icarus Landacker, Vikram Kohler, Charlie Levine. Good evening. Good evening. Hello, I am Icarus Landacker, a senior at Princess Anne High School and a non-binary student. For those who may not know, a non-binary person is someone who does not identify with the binary genders of male or female, so I am one of the many students this policy will directly affect. As I mentioned before, I go by the name Icarus, and while it's not written in pen or engraved on stone, it is my name nonetheless. Identity cannot be forced onto anyone, and that is what this policy is proposing. Although it is not banning the use of preferred names outright, it is requiring parental permission, which could ban the rights for, the, for students among the 62% of individuals who face disapproval from family at home, according to the National Library of Medicine. Any person, including students, has the right to privacy. If students wish to keep their sexuality or gender identity private from their family out of fear of disapproval, or in extreme cases, disownment, then they should have that right. No person should live in fear of isolation, verbal or physical harassment, 
or the potential of becoming homeless just because they wanted a little more comfort at school. The first adult I came out to was a teacher. The first adult to accept me was a teacher. The first time I felt safe was in the walls of my school where rainbow stickers adorned the hallways, labeling each door frame with the words safe space, acting as portals to alternate dimensions where students can have one more hour where they are loved and accepted for who they are. If this proposal were passed, th those stickers cherished by many at my school would be ripped off my school's walls, leaving no behind nothing but a sticky residue. Salt would trail down the red faces of trans students who just spent an hour crying after being yelled at by their family. Their muscles would ache from the tremors of anxiety that would rack their body. And if you think I am over-exaggerating, let me tell you that I speak from personal experience. And it is an epidemic I have seen plague many of my friends. If this policy were passed, those stickers would leave small scars on the walls just like the ones that decorate trans students' wrists after they face days of dead naming, dysphoria, and depression just because those around them don't have the heart to utter two or three simple syllables that are their names and pronouns. We are not asking for people to change their beliefs and ideologies by refusing this policy. No, we are simply asking that you accept us as we are. Calling someone by their name is the most basic form of respect we can give a person. 30 seconds. It acknowledges their identity, their existence, and their rights. If we cannot call each other by our names, then we will, new we will never truly learn acceptance. Thank you. Our next speaker is Vikram Kohli, Charlie Levine, and then Andrea Palimo Jayo. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Vikram Kohli. I'm the senior class president and the president of the Sexuality and Gender Alliance at Princess Anne High School. In Virginia Beach City Public Schools within the past year, books written by queer and black authors were removed from shelves without a formal challenge, librarians working for the district had their safety threatened, and teachers moved to other employment positions because of the lack of support for them. This hatred and opposition towards employees and students still pervades through Governor Youngkin's proposed public policy titled the 2022 model policies on the privacy, dignity, and respect for all students and parents in Virginia's public schools. This policy demonstrates the wave of homophobia, transphobia, and discriminatory practices pushed in public schools in the past year. Though this policy is just a draft and has not been enacted officially, it has the potential and will threaten the safety and security and emotional well-being of LGBTQ students, specifically transgender students, in school districts if it is passed. Though the terms of the policy, which include deadnaming students, preventing students from using their preferred pronouns, and outing students to parents, may all be waived with parental permission, given the lack of acceptance of queer students by parents, this policy could threaten their physical and emotional safety. And while there is a judicial precedent that protects some of these rights, the possibility of the policy being passed is concerning. Queer youth already disproportionately, are already disproportionately affected by mental health, as aforementioned, and have, and have higher rates than their heterosexual counterparts of homelessness and suicide. Policies such as this one proposed by Governor Youngkin would only make the disparity worse. Further, the policies also threaten the positions of teachers who don't follow the policy could negatively be affected through their employment. As a queer student myself, this blatantly discriminatory policy scares me as it could threaten the safety of students not only disheartens me, but also leads me to question whether the support I felt by this community has been in vain. By enacting the 22 model policies, the board would be making it clear that it cares more about appeasing public opinion to maintain a local political agenda and do not support the LGBTQ plus community and queer youth. Putting students first means putting all students first. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charlie Levine. Andrea Palimimo Jaco, and then Jacob Cruz. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Charlie Levine, and I'm a senior in the Legal Studies Academy at First Colonial High School. I'm also very involved in our school's theater department, the Patriot Playhouse, and Thespian Troop 3178. Some of my closest friends can and will be affected should these model policies proposed by the Virginia Department of Education be implemented in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. When these policies were released, I distinctly remember a shift in the atmosphere and energy of our school. There was a fear that students would no longer be able to safely, freely, and comfortably express their authentic selves. Theater is a space where everyone is welcome, an extracurricular activity where students are invited and encouraged to try new things, get out of their comfort zones, 
And as a mentor of mine once said, dare to fail gloriously. We cannot take risks and discover who we are if we don't feel safe to make these mistakes. And this applies to everything in life. Using the correct name and pronoun carries so much significance and has a profound impact on the mental and physical health of LGBTQ youth. I reached out to a friend who would be directly impacted should these policies or anything similar be implemented and enforced in Virginia Beach City Public Schools. He said, these policies would force me to go against who I am as an individual. It tells society that everything about me is wrong. These policies could tremendously increase suicidal thoughts and suicide rates because many kids won't feel loved or accepted, not just by society, but possibly their own parents. It put puts kids at risk to be abused and even kicked out of their own homes. Schools are supposed to be a safe place for students. A policy that prevents transgender and non-binary students from being respected and protected at school directly opposes this sentiment. If teachers are prohibited from using a student's preferred name and pronouns, or they are forced to out these students to parents without any consideration of the student's safety or their wishes, these students who already face incredible challenges in their lives will lose what may be the only time and place that they have to freely express themselves. And I get it. It's easy to fear that, that which we do not understand, to dig our heels in and reject change. However, we have to make an effort to learn, to better ourselves, and to accept and accommodate LGBTQ plus students. Thank you. 30 seconds. Our next speaker is Andrea Palomino Jo, and then Jacob Cruz. Welcome. Good evening. My name is Andrea Palomino Hayo, and I'm a senior at First Colonial High School. This is a testimony from a transgender student who transitioned from female to male. It details his challenges in and out of school with gender dysphoria. Its content is very heavy, but we believe it is necessary to communicate the harm these model policies could have on the students of this district. In school, I use he, him pronouns. My identity did not exclude me from class examples, answering questions, or any conversations that took place in the classroom. On the slim chances my class was split into girl and boy groups, I was always included in the boy group. I was lucky, to have, I was lucky enough to have a safe and pleasant classroom experience in reference to my transgender identity. That is why I am scared. I am scared of what school is turning into. I am scared for my friends. But I should not be scared at a place where I should have all my attention focused on learning. The policies being implemented will not help further my education. If anything, they will be taking away from it. There is no greater pain than being trapped in the wrong body, but to have it rubbed into your face over and over again is its own kind of torture. I have grown up hating everything that I am because my body did not match who my brain told me I was. When I was little, I didn't understand. I didn't understand why I was forced into dresses and why they made me cry. I didn't understand why the boys in my classes grew crushes on me because I had always believed I was one of them. I wore boy clothes, had only boy friends, played with only boys during recess, competed with them in academics, and was even on an all-boys soccer team. Once I began growing, I started to hate everything about myself. I hated my hair, my thighs, my arms, my eyes, my name, everything. When I went dress shopping for the first time, I went home and sobbed. I cried so, I cried so hard I was suffocating. I asked the universe to take it all away. I asked it to widen my shoulders and shrink my chest. I asked her to take away the body that I was in and to swap it for a new one because somewhere, someone had made a mistake. Something was not right and I had, to, I had known from a very early age. The more years that passed, the harder it got. I felt trapped and like so many other transgender kids my age, I wanted to die. No one should ever feel that way. I'm sharing this because we are people. We are your classmates, your children, your child's best friend, your students. We are human, and we feel, and we hurt. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jacob Cruz. Well, welcome. Hello, I'm Jacob Cruz. I'm a high school student here in Virginia Beach, and I'm here because there is one key question that our group has left unanswered. You know exactly how harmful we think this policy would be. You know exactly how much all of us care, whether we are directly affected or not. The one question that still needs to be answered is why did we come here? Why did we come to our school board with these fears, concerns, and burning passions for change? We came here because we have faith that our school board and our school system is fighting for all students to be the best that they possibly can be. 
We came here because we believe that in spite of all the bumps in the road, all the differences that we may have, every teacher, custodian, administrator, principal, and school board member has or cares about us deeply. Not about model policies, not about right or left, Republican or Democrat, but about the students. We believe that's what rests in all of your hearts. Myself and our group of student activists and many more are so deathly afraid of what our schools might become if these model policies see the light of day. We are afraid that our transgender peers will not be able to be them best, their best selves. We are afraid that our friends are being robbed of the only place in the world where they truly believe they can be themselves. And if I'm being brutally honest, I believe that my transgender fear, or I'm afraid that my transgender friends might not be here in following school years if this policy succeeds. I know what it's like to feel like you don't have a home, to feel like there isn't a single person in the world who loves you for you, and that's why I'm here. That is why we are all here. That is why we never want our, tra our transgender peers to feel like they don't have someone in their corner, and that's what this policy is making them feel like, believe me. That is why we rush from work, softball practice, a lacrosse game, homework, college apps, all the other things that we have going on in our lives. That's why we put on suits, that's why we came here today, why we wrote our speeches, and why we put so much time scrambling, putting in the effort to be here today to speak to you. It's because we want to support every kid who feels like they don't have a voice. Every day I go out to lunch and there's a kid named Nick who sits at my table. And this kid has the just biggest smile on their face every single day. And every day I'm so glad to have them at, their, at my table because they have something funny to say. He's always got some kind of great story or great joke or something to tell me. And Nick is transgender, but I don't think of Nick as someone who's just transgender. I think of, them, or I think of him as someone who makes our community better, someone who makes my forensics practices better, theater rehearsals better, every part of First Colonial High School better. And those are the kinds of kids that you're putting on the line if you allow that something like this policy to come. We believe that like seconds. us, you care about every single student, whether they're on the fringes, bullied, bullied, failing classes, or if they're NHS presidents, state champions, or homecoming royalty. We believe that you are on this board to fight for all of us, and that is precisely why we came to you. We believe that you care about us. Now please prove us right. Thank you. I'll do a final call for Joey Coley. Please proceed. Okay. Our next speakers will be Jacob Hicks, Sarah Gerloff, Natasha Wise. Good evening. Good evening. How are you doing, members of the board, uh, Mr. Superintendent? The, um, I, I don't know. I talked to Miss George about this the other day. My kids are always wondering why the bathrooms are always locked. I'm clearly in the wrong spot. We're talking about something very different here tonight. Um, but the bathrooms apparently are always locked. And when they try to go to the bathroom during a passing break or whatnot, Again, they're locked up or there might only be one available to them. Is there a reason why we don't have available bathrooms for the students at school? <laughs> I hope you know, sir, we can't engage with you now, but we'll be happy to follow up. Right. I was asked to come to the school board about it. So, all right. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sarah Gerloff, Natasha Wise, and then Melissa Lukeson. Good evening. Good evening. So when I was a child, I was considered sort of a tomboy. I did not like dresses or girly toys. I prefer, preferred to play with race car sets, catch lightning bugs, and play in the woods. I also loved animals a lot. In fact, I loved them so much, I went through a phase when I wanted to be a dog. Then another time, I wanted to be a horse. I remember pretending to be a horse by prancing around the house, jumping over makeshift hurdles and neighing. My parents knew this was a phase and me just expressing my imagination. They did not lie to me and brainwash me by telling me I could be a horse if I wanted to. They just let it play out. It is a scientific fact that humans are born either male or female, and the genetic code for one or the other exists within every cell of the body. One cannot simply decide to change biological sex by changing clothing, names, taking hormones, or by adding or removing body appendages. We must consider that children with an extreme desire to be the opposite sex may have psychological issues that need to be addressed. If this type of extreme behavior is allowed to perpetuate and encouraged, it could be even more harmful to the child and those around the child. Agreeing that a child can change sex further confuses the child and other children since it is a lie. In order to fix a problem, you must get to the root cause of the problem. Going along with a lie will never solve the problem. It is just a mask. 
Lying to a child, child is not compassion. It is harmful. It is not right. It is not right for adults to promote and go along with the transgender ideology. This wrong behavior will never be right since it causes mental harm. We manifest the world with our thoughts, our words, and our actions. When you think in an upside down wrong way, you begin to create an upside down wrong world with your wrong words and your wrong actions. Most of you on this school board with Spence at the helm are completely upside down and wrong in many ways, but, but you're still hell bent on proving that you are right and you do not see nor care about the damage you are causing to the minds of the most vulnerable. You're guilty of causing harm to many innocent children and that is never acceptable. Remember, lying is never a solution. 30 seconds. Our next speaker is Natasha Wise, Melissa Lukeson, and then Jamal Gunn. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Natasha, and I am a mother of a third grader at Lincoln Park Elementary. On Monday, September 26, my daughter came home from school distraught. She explained to me that her teacher, Ms. Harrison, told her that her My Culture project was wrong and to take it back home and tell your mom to fix it. She went on to explain that her teacher told her that she was not American and was in fact from Africa. The assignment requested the students to interview a family member and find out what country they were from. Well, my daughter stayed at USA. Ms. Harrison insisted this was incorrect. I thought she could not be true until my child opens her Chromebook and hands me a sticky note with the word Africa written on it. I was appalled. Needless to say, this was an insult to injury. Ms. Harrison further instructed my daughter to draw African clothing on her paper character. Let's all please remember first and foremost, Africa is a continent, not a country. I immediately contacted the teacher via Seesaw and requested she refrain from sending such correspondence through my child and contact me directly. I received no response. Not only did she tell my daughter her project was wrong and she was not American in front of the entire class, causing not only confusion but embarrassment, but she proceeded to tell my child, let me look where your last name is from. And to be clear, my daughter's last name is Smith, a common last name. And if we're getting into our culture background, I'm sure the last name came from our ancestors being enslaved and having to take on the name of their owner. I would like to ask you all to take a personal moment Yet, imagine your child coming home from school where he or she should feel safe and free to be their self and not question their identity. The media outlet plays a big enough part on division of race, and it is unacceptable for any child to feel out of place, and as we as parents should not feel, that is acceptable either. I have met with the principal and to this date have not received an apology for this absurd treatment, but was told there would be no meeting set up while this was under investigation. And per my research, there is nothing in the bylaws that a meeting cannot be conducted as such for Ms. Harrison to take full accountability for her actions while this was under investigation. Furthermore, the teacher is being treated as a victim as opposed to my daughter, the true victim in this situation. In conclusion, 30 seconds. is this assignment appropriate for third graders, for anyone with a DNA results in front of them? Who is a teacher to determine my child or anyone's background or determine her culture practice? I implore the Virginia Beach School Board to look deeper into this situation and offer fair and justice resolution for my child and any other student who may have this assignment or geographically challenged teachers. Thank you for your time. Our next speaker is Melissa Lukeson, then Jamal Gunn, then Seiko Warner. Good evening. Good evening. First, thank you, Ms. Owens, for your swift assistance, compassion, and sensitivity. And Ms. Felton, for your follow-up asking how you can help Ms. Wise. Unfortunately, the escalation, the escalation of the situation falls directly on school leadership. When the Lincoln Park principal planned a meeting with herself, the school counselor, and Ms. Halverson, I understood what can happen in a room with three white women of power and privilege sitting across the table from a black woman. I offered to help Ms. Wise advocate for herself and her daughter by joining her at the meeting to balance the power in the room. The goal of the meeting with Ms. Wise was to hold Ms. Halverson accountable in a difficult conversation with grace and compassion. Unfortunately, she lacked the courage to face Ms. Wise to apologize authentically. 
Instead, she hid behind the principal, excusing her from the meeting, which revealed another glaring example of how white women protect the feelings of other white women at the expense of a black mother and a black child. Did they believe their decision was best at that moment and their feelings and reactions were not racially motivated? I believe they believe that. That's why we must have conversations and education about our unconscious bias, which is racism sneaking in without you knowing it. No one likes to talk about it because if you're white, you have it, just like Elf on a Shelf. What happened to Ms. Wise and her daughter is not a new story. Virginia Beach didn't integrate for 15 years after the Brown v. Board of Ed decision. Educators have been a white majority because integration was only required for students, not teachers. Thousands of educators were fired or relegated to service roles in schools. That is why black children do not see as many teachers that look like them. This white supremacy system has done an excellent job of teaching us as white people that racism is wrong, but talking about racism is worse. When I understood that, I began my journey on how to be an anti-racist. Our institutions and systems like education are designed with only white people in mind. This homework assignment is a great example. This young college educated white teacher did not pause before denying this child's right to say she's an American without the hyphen. Whether or not they are from Africa was not a conversation this mom had with her child. To the board members that push for parental rights, are you, any of you angry that a teacher told a child that she's from Africa when these parents haven't discussed family lineage because they've chosen to wait to share the darkest parts of American history? Maybe they aren't ready to tell their children that many black Americans can only seconds. trace their family tree five or six generations before they hit the brick wall stopping at 1870 census. A reminder that only 152 years ago, black people were considered property, not people, and given surnames of their white enslavers. This is why you cannot just look up the origin of last name like Smith, as Ms. Halverson tried to do with her third grade student. The lack of cultural competency this teacher displayed considering they received a college degree within the last 10 years is astounding, which proves you need to get serious about this. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jamal Gunn and then Seiko Varner. Mr. Next. Varner, please proceed. Seiko Varner. And welcome. Welcome, welcome. Welcome administration and school board. Wow, you have a difficult job. And we applaud you for the difficult decisions that you'll be making. Um, I helped create an organization called the Community Action Team. And Community Action Team is an apolitical organization focused on black empowerment focused on ensuring that the community can better advocate for themselves. In one of our recent meetings, one of our watchdogs, our watchdogs are members of the committee who attend school board and city council meetings and other uh, political um, events and report back to us so we can make sure that we're aware of the politics that impact us. And the uh, situation that was just discussed by the last two speakers fell in our laps last week. Now, the community action team is pretty certain that this situation is gonna be handled and handled well. And we hope that we can find a way to make sure that these types of situations don't continue. Uh, it's kind of interesting, my ancestry includes those blacks who were here before 1492 as well as those blacks who were brought over from the continent of Africa, as well as Irish and Native American as well. And I realized that some of that story is not necessarily told in the books that we have in our curriculum, and that's something we may need to change. However, I think the way this was handled wasn't the best. And I'm sure that it's gonna to come to an amicable resolution soon. I'm bringing this to you because although this, this may not necessarily be in your purview, it's definitely in your sphere of influence. So let us all come together to make sure that these types of situations don't continue. And last thing I'd like to share is with the community action team, um, we've developed a couple of tools to help the community better advocate for themselves. So 
We'll be working with you, watching you, recording you, evaluating the same way that we do our students to make sure that they rise to the occasion and become the best students that they can be. We want to make sure that our elected officials and our seated officials can rise to the occasion and be the best that they can be. And speaking of the best that they can be, I want to thank 30 seconds. the school system because my beautiful daughter and my handsome son, who both graduated from Virginia Beach schools, are doing exceedingly well. My son just started a job. He's making more than I am. I'm a little jealous. But the school experience he had here in Virginia Beach helped him get there. And my daughter is also a uh, teacher in Chicago, doing very well. So thank you for what you're doing. And we're here with you. Let's work together to make sure this doesn't continue. Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. So. I, I okay. So protocol would have me turn to my colleagues, and it, uh, barring any objection, we have a speaker. Who is the speaker still available to speak? Is there any objection, colleagues? Okay. And please identify the speaker, Madam Clerk. Ms. You can just state your name, sir. My name is Jamal Gunn. Thank you, Mr. Gunn. Good evening. Um, my name is Jamal Gunn. I am a member of the Virginia Beach Human Rights Commission. However, I just wanted to, wanted to come and speak really briefly. I'm, obviously, I have three minutes. I don't want to take too much of your time. Um, about uh, the case that I believe um, you've been speaking about, I do apologize. I was not here. I was in, stuck in traffic. But um, I just wanted to just start off by saying I to prepare for this speech, what I'm about to say, I looked at my high school yearbook today, and as I flipped through the, through the pages, about 20 students on each page of my graduating class. On every page, you can count on one hand how many African American students were on each page, about 20 to 30 kids on each page. But there are maybe one, two, maybe three black faces that we saw 47 in total in my graduating class of over or or for nearly 450 students that was 1998 and although it's anecdotal it's something that i know was shared by my brother as well as my older brother who graduated in 1997 and my oldest brother who graduated in 1991 and that is something that i'm still hearing about in 2022 I mean, I know it's, like I said, I know it's anecdotal, but it tells me a lot about the kind of diversity that is going on in Virginia Beach. Although Virginia Beach is a diverse city, there is something that is going on that doesn't make it seem that way to our students. And when we have teachers who are making, first of all, I do want to make this clear. If a teacher is telling a student um, or making a student feel some type of way and using incorrect language, telling a student to go research Africa, or making the student feel bad about their own American heritage, they are ill-qualified to be a teacher to teach any kid in Virginia Beach Public Schools. I just want to make that really clear. But again, overall, again, this is a, it's not just a simple problem about one student in one school. This is a problem of culture and the entire school system and it's a problem of what our teachers are, the impact our teacher, teachers are having on students. They leave a huge footprint on these students, and this is something that they're going to carry with them for the entirety of their lives. It's something that we have to carry with for the entirety of our lives. The same sort seconds. of situations that happen to the student has happened to me, has happened to my brothers, has happened to anybody and everybody who is African American in the city, and this is something we do not forget about. The student is going to carry this for the rest of her life. I just want you guys to remember this. It's something that's going to be imprinted on her for as long as she lives. That is what we're doing to our students. Please keep that in mind. And please take action on this. I know I'm not going to give up on this. I'm going to make sure this is brought to the attention of the Human Rights and Commission. And that is time. And we will be keeping forward on this as well. Thank you. Madam Chair, that was our last speaker for this evening. Thank you, Madam Clerk. This brings us to the information portion of our meeting, and we begin with the uh, our educational equity plan presentation. And welcome, Mr. Harris. 
Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, Dr. Spence. I'm pleased to appear before you this evening to share the ed Educational Equity Plan. This presentation will provide a timeline of events and actions taken that have led us to where we are today. It will highlight the high yield strategies for each of the six goals. It will identify action steps for meeting those goals. And it will present success indicators to show how we will measure progress. Admittedly, this is a rather extensive document. You might want to take it after you read it and do some bicep curls or something. Um, but there are a few reasons why. First, this is a three-year plan. Tonight, I'm only going to talk about uh, those action steps that we plan to implement this year. Secondly, there are a number of action steps that are already taking place. And so the work isn't new. It was important to include that in the action plan because our success indicators are directly Im impacted by those action steps. Finally, and most importantly, this plan is a result of hours of collaboration and crucial conversations with stakeholders. Also, we've done an intense data analysis. Frankly, we have a lot of work to do. You will notice throughout this document that we are seeking to increase opportunities for all students and staff. But there is an emphasis placed on areas of identified need, such as black students, particularly males, students with disabilities, English learners, and students who are economically disadvantaged. Equity is all about providing opportunities, and it looks and feels different to each of us. The board defines equity as fostering a barrier-free environment whereby all students, regardless of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, sexual orientation or gender identity, pregnancy, childbirth, or related medical conditions, age, marital status, disability, or genetic information, have the opportunity to benefit from the establishment of high standards and the provision of access, support, effective and inclusive learning environments, and resources required for a high quality education. In addition to a definition of equity and the purpose statement, board policy 5-4 calls for an equity assessment to identify equitable practices and procedures within the school division that have historically or are currently resulting in inequities of opportunity for students and staff. An external consulting firm conducted an equity assessment between January and May of 2021. Information was gathered through interviews with stakeholders, focus groups comprised of stakeholders, and existing data analysis. The assessment team then conducted a tour of findings to summarize and share what they discovered. The conclusions of the equity assessment were published in November of 2021 those findings led to 14 recommendations presented as a starting point for further conversation and the development of an equity plan as required by policy 5-4. In February of 2022, the Administrative Equity Planning Committee was established. This group is comprised of two board members, Ms. Owens and Ms. Weems, as well as students, caregivers, staff, and community leaders. The committee met five times between February and August 2022 to develop action steps, review input and new information, calibrate efforts, and propose success indicators. Members of the planning committee divided into smaller work groups, which allowed them to focus on one goal that aligned with their personal area of expertise or interest. The groups then provided feedback for each other via gallery walks and revised their work as needed. Each of the six work groups was led by a VBCPS administrator with significant understanding of the goals. They challenged each other to peel back the layers and try to get to the root cause of the issues we face. Then identify action steps that make sense, are realistic, are data informed, and reflect what we heard from stakeholders. This plan is a direct outcome of the hard work done by the planning committee. When you read the equity plan, you will see that the goals of the equity plan are aligned with the six goals in our strategic framework, Compass of 2025. The 14 recommendations are embedded in the plan and noted as equity assessment priorities. 
To the extent possible, each section begins with an overview of pertinent data for that goal area. The data I will share for each goal area includes some of the measures we intend to use as part of an equity data dashboard, which you will hear more about when I share goal six. For goal one, educational excellence, we have provided data reflecting reading on grade level, SOL passing rates by subject area, as well as measures addressing the extent to which students with disabilities are included in regular classrooms for specified periods of time. A review of that data reveals that lower percentages of black, Hispanic, economically disadvantaged students and students with disabilities were reading on grade level compared to their peers. Lower percentages of black, Hispanic, students with disabilities and English language learners passed the SOL assessments compared to their peers. Based on the most recent data available from the Virginia Department of Education, VBCPS did not meet the state targets for including students with disabilities in the regular classroom for a specified period of time. Each goal has three to four high yield strategies for equitably meeting that goal. Each page in the plan includes one of those high yield strategies, which are identified at the top just under the goal, in this case, the white text and the purple box. Under that, we have identified specific action steps we plan to take to support the high yield strategy. Again, to honor the board's time, I will only review action steps to be taken this school year. Goal one is educational excellence. The first high yield strategy is to implement and share teaching practices that foster deeper learning and engagement and are adaptable to diverse student needs with an emphasis on black males, economically disadvantaged, English learners, and students with disabilities. Action steps for this year are as follows. Review current processes for students with disability trans transition meetings and identify areas to increase engagement and foster a sense of belonging. Identify and develop professional learning opportunities for teachers and administrators for the purpose of building capacity to foster student engagement identify engaging teaching practices currently being utilized by VBCPS staff to foster deeper learning, and provide each school with least restrictive environment data and have schools reflect on data and consider possible changes needed. The next high yield strategy is to incorporate multicultural resources and materials into the curriculum at all levels. We plan to review and assess the current status of multicultural resources and materials in the curriculum. We will develop protocol for teachers to use when selecting supplemental multicultural materials and resources for instruction. We will develop considerations for curriculum writers to use when selecting materials and resources which incorporate multicultural perspectives. The last high yield strategy for goal one is to develop and embed protocols and curriculum that help facilitate effective classroom discussions from multiple perspectives. We plan to review the curriculum for current protocols to assist effective classroom discussions about sensitive topics using board policy 6-8 regarding controversial issues as a guide. We will integrate all adopted protocols and, strate and strategies into the SEL and CRP stockpiles. Goal two is student well-being. A major finding in the equity assessment was the disproportionate rate of referrals and suspensions for black males. This isn't anything new. Many divisions face the same issue. And when we dig deeper, we see that rates for economically disadvantaged students and students with disabilities are also high. We know that relationships are everything. And so the ability for staff to establish, maintain and repair relationships will contribute to reduced initial occurrence and decrease reoccurrence. In addition to examining referral and suspension data, the equity plan also includes student perceptions of their school and the extent to which it is safe, welcoming, and inclusive. Student sense of belonging is also included. For each student group examined, the percentage of students reporting their school was inclusive was lower than the percentage reporting their school was safe or wel welcoming. In addition, the percentage of students reporting a sense of belonging range from 75% for Hispanic students to 83% for Asian students. 
The first high yield strategy in goal two is to implement prevention and intervention strategies and alternatives to suspension. We plan to recognize current best practices VBCPS schools are using to establish, maintain, and repair relationships for the purpose of preventing incidents before they happen. We will, con we will conduct discipline data review semi-annually to identify and respond to referral trends and specific areas for intervention. These action steps are critical. Intervention without prevention does not work. You wouldn't bail water from a boat without also plugging the leak. The second high yield strategy is to increase the number and diversity of mentorship opportunities. We plan to clearly define mentorship as it relates to elementary and secondary levels. We will explore additional opportunities for student to student mentor, mentor relationships, local businesses, colleges and universities, our military, and individual community members who have a desire to get involved. Mentorships can make a big difference. And I'm not talking about tutoring or coaching. I mean, just having the person in your life that you can connect with, learn from, or be inspired by. Sometimes all it takes is for someone to show love and grace. Be that champion that Rita Pearson talks about in that epic TED talk. And recognize the person I'm describing may not always be a family member. The third high yield strategy is to amplify student voice through increased opportunities for leadership and input into school level decisions to ensure a sense of belonging across diverse student groups. We plan to investigate the possibility of adding a student representative or liaison to the school board. We will identify if and how students are currently serving on advisory panels across the division. We will review club and activity, activity offerings that promote student leadership capacity building at each school to determine if programs should or will be replicated for the purpose of extending opportunities for all students. Goal three encompass to 2025 is student ownership of learning. For this area, we lifted up measures that address secondary students enrollment in and successful completion of rigorous courses graduates demonstrating college, career, and civic readiness, high school academy enrollment data, gifted identification information, as well as college enrollment data. The data revealed that across college and career readiness measures, a similar pattern emerged where percentages were lowest for black and economically disadvantaged students, as well as students with disabilities. Less than 50% of graduates in the male, black, Economic, economically disadvantaged or students with disabilities group enrolled in college within one year. Relative to their enrollment percentages, black and Hispanic students, male students, and economically disadvantaged students were underrepresented in high school academies. Relative to their enrollment percentages, the largest instances of underrepresentation and gifted identification were among black students and economically disadvantaged students. The first high yield strategy under goal three is to offer supplementary and extended learning experiences at the secondary level to address disparities in advanced coursework participation. We plan to review supplementary materials and resources currently being utilized to prepare students for advanced coursework. We will develop a framework and schedule for synchronous and asynchronous supplementary and extended learning support. We will communicate opportunity for supplementary coursework support and post a schedule for students and families. The second high yield strategy is to further promote and expand equitable access to services and programs that support students future aspirations. We plan to continue to review application process for academies and gifted programs to promote inclusion and diversity. We will increase communication and promotional efforts at the elementary level across multiple staff groups and modalities to ensure families are aware of program offerings and the application process. The third high yield strategy is to increase awareness around entry points and support for students interested in enrolling in advanced coursework and programs. We plan to implement shared division expectations to use multiple sources of information to determine individual student readiness for advanced coursework. 
we will design professional learning opportunities to prepare educators to examine student data sources for the purpose of readily identifying potential success in advanced coursework and programs. We will ensure families are made aware of resources and pathways to enrollment in advanced coursework and programs. We will ensure all students have identified pathways for future goals and actions through the academic and career planning process and ensure families are engaged in and made aware of that process. And we will provide opportunities for current and prospective students to engage in activities at the academy sites and specialized centers. Goal four is an exemplary diversified workforce. Data elements include the demographics of students, instructional staff, and administrative staff, as well as ratings of job satisfaction by various employee groups. Here, we see that there is a small percentage of instructional staff of color relative to the student population. No question, this is a common issue nationally. Research suggests that students of color who have at least one teacher of color may do better on tests and are less likely to have disciplinary issues. Research also suggests that white students show improved problem solving, critical thinking, and creativity when they have diverse teachers. You can also see that the percentage of staff who reported being satisfied with their job ranged from 72% for multiracial staff members to 94% for Hispanic staff members. The first high yield strategy under goal four is to continue to strengthen the recruitment and selection process. We plan to encourage teacher participation at recruiting fairs, especially aligned to alma mater and other personal ties. We will review and calibrate application screening processes, processes for the purpose of establishing consistency across buildings. We will increase intentionality in the recruitment of a diverse workforce, including outreach to and partnership with historically black colleges and universities and other minority serving institutions and messaging that will appeal to a diverse audience. And we will ensure job descriptions are accurate and updated. The second high yield strategy is to increase employee retention by fostering a positive working environment. We plan to evaluate effectiveness of recruitment and retention through surveys and focus groups. We will review existing employee recognition programs to highlight staff across the division who demonstrate personal growth, commitment to equity, and support of student learning. We will develop a stay interview process and we will increase VBCPS employee perks, discounts, and offerings. Professional learning is a huge factor when it comes to recruiting and retaining staff, as well as ensuring that the staff we have are well equipped to meet the challenges of the ever-changing educational landscape. Throughout the equity plan, we have identified professional learning opportunities to support that work. Most of that focused on capacity building. Having served as a professional learning coordinator here in VBCPS, I know firsthand how talented our teachers are. We have many that are just thirsty for knowledge. We plan to leverage that by soliciting teachers, aides, and specialists who are interested in serving as design fellows. This cohort of professionals will develop strategies and practices that they will use in their learning spaces to help inform future offerings to a larger audience. We will also look to establish consistency across buildings by supporting culturally competent pedagogy and practice. Pages 26 and 27 in the equity plan pull out the professional learning components to provide a comprehensive view of what we are proposing. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Janine Gorham, Director of Professional Growth and Innovation for developing this crosswalk of professional learning offerings. Goal five of Compass to 2025 focuses on mutually supportive partnerships. Our division does a great job of engaging families and we want to continue to strengthen those efforts. Our Office of Family and Community Engagement will lead much of the work in goal five. Measures we have identified for this area include the percentage of families aware of events and programs and resources the division provides to families to support students and satisfaction with these opportunities. The data reveal that the percentage of parents and guardians indicating that they were aware of events, programs, and resources provided to families to support students 
ranged from 67% for multiracial parents to 79% for Asian parents. Of parents who attended a VBCPS event or program or used resources in 2021-2022, the percentage expressing satisfaction ranged from 78% for multiracial parents to 94% for Asian parents. The first high yield strategy under goal five is to partner with local agencies to provide wraparound services for students and families. We plan to develop a plan for a cradle to career continuum to identify local resources potentially available to families in VBCPS. VBCPS and FACE will sustain community programs and events to connect partners with schools and school and families, providing additional supports for families most in need. We will increase VBEF support of curriculum development, teacher innovation, and student achievement through programs. The second high yield strategy is to create an accessible database of translators. We plan to establish a VBCPS language access policy to ensure reliable systems of translation and interpretation for all VBCPS students and their families. We will identify and train family liaisons embedded in the schools to develop relationships with our ESL populations. We will increase the availability of translated documents by developing a division-wide database and protocol for using translated documents. We will audit current language services and providers utilized across VBCPS offices in order to identify and eliminate redundancies and gaps in service. And we will identify populations to be assisted with translation and interpretation services, recruit, hire, and retain translators and interpreters to work across school sites and feeder patterns. The third high yield strategy is to create an accessible partnership database. We plan to identify procedures and platform any platform for internal and external partners to use to interact with schools, notifying them of what services are available in real time. We will create a public facing database or web page to identify entities that are partnering with schools and promote future partnership opportunities. We will identify diversity of current partners and increase diversity in future partnerships to reflect an equitable cross section of the community. And we will conduct annual, an annual review of the internal and external partner list each spring. Goal six is organizational effectiveness and efficiency. The Compass of 2025 navigational markers for this goal uh, area do not lend themselves to disaggregation by reporting groups, but several new indicators have been proposed for inclusion as part of the equity data dashboard and will be described momentarily. Bless you. The first high yield strategy under goal six is to provide adequate and sustainable human and capital resources. We plan to review current staffing assignments and create a utilization chart to identify how reading and math specialists are being used in each school. We will identify other positions to be reviewed for the purpose of maximizing utilization of staff. The second high yield strategy is to collaborate with community business or organizations to leverage resources to support equitable opportunities to level the playing field. We plan to create a communication plan to share with organizations to include opportunities to secure additional resources, both human and financial, in high need schools. And we will partner with city and schools PTAs to increase membership and promote diversity. The final high yield strategy is to develop and publish an equity data dashboard. These are the proposed indicators for the dashboard. The items on this dashboard were identified based on input received from the Administrative Educational Equity Planning Committee. Many of the items listed are currently navigational markers we use to monitor progress on Compass of 2025 and would involve reporting out the data in a disaggregated manner. Items that are not currently assessed are indicated with an asterisk. The next steps for the data dashboard include gathering feedback on proposed indicators and identifying the format for sharing and posting the equity dashboard. 
I would like to thank Dr. Lisa Banneke, Executive Director of Planning, Innovation, and Accountability, and her team for providing the data elements of this plan. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone else who had a hand in developing this plan. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you and your staff very much, and, and all the members of the team for this. So who would like to start? Ms. Owens. No surprise there. I'm going to start. I'm going to have questions. Um, I just want to start off by saying how excited I am about this plan and uh, the direction that we're going. I think today's uh, speakers and, in general, things that we've seen over since I've been on the board uh, tell us that this is it's timely it's maybe even late but here <laughs> uh, and so I'm I'm really I'm happy about what what we're seeing I think uh, goal four that talks about that uh, focus on culturally competent pedagogy and practice pedagogy <laughs> uh, again very timely and I really appreciate the, uh, on the, the last page, that goal six, when we're talking about the data dashboard, uh, that level of transparency can be difficult for an organization. But I do think it's truly the kind of catalyst for change. If we're not willing to kind of look at how we're doing in, uh, on these different data points and be open about it, then you lose the, the true motivation, if you will, for accountability. We're holding ourselves accountability, and we're being open with the public on what we're doing, how we're doing on it, and there may be times when we don't move in the direction that we want to move statistically on our, our data there, and that we're going to be open with that and say, okay, something we were doing was not working, we're not going the direction we wanna go, and uh, to be able to show that progress. And so I think it, it takes a, a level of courageousness from our division to be open and sharing about our growth progress and our, our growth journey, because it's as much as I want it to be a linear path right to where we want to go, we know that it's, it's not going to necessarily be a straight path, but this gives us the accountability. And so I appreciate uh, this. I appreciate all the hard work. I know have a, a taste of how much of that went on behind the scenes. Um, so thank you all. OK, thank you, Mrs. Manning. Thank you so much, Mr. Harris. So one thing that I love about this is that you have just presented all of the evidence, good and bad, um, in the data. And um, something that I've been looking at and talking about for a long time are reading levels. And you have shown truly what's going on here in this chart, reading on grade level, grades three through nine. It, it's a bar graph, so I can't see ex the exact percentages, but I'm guessing around 30% of all students cannot read on grade level in those grades. And about 40% of economically disadvantaged students can't. And I, I see this in discipline. I see this. Students who are, are coming before the board are struggling in school. And so I, I do believe that this is a big factor in discipline problems in our classrooms, um, that students are not reading on grade level. So I thank you for addressing that and um, acknowledging that, because before you can correct a problem, you have to first acknowledge it. So I want to thank you for that. Um, one thing that I've been asking for for a while that's in the, um, the equity policy is that um, implicit bias training is going to be um, required. Um, but I've, I, I've asked a number of times of what is that training? Um, can you provide me some information on what that training is? Right, and so the, the, the term Im implicit bias obviously um, is something that is a, a hot topic. And, and we uh, believe that we, we are all products of our environment. And our experiences shape who we are and, and, and what we think. And so uh, exploring our learned and lived experiences is something that we will 
uh, we encourage our staff to do. Quite honestly, we've not identified a specific, um, you know, tool to do that. Uh, and so I don't want to misspeak and, and, okay. and say, but it is something that we do. It is important. Okay, and, and thank we you. absolutely I, must. Yeah, I appreciate that because I've been asking that question for a while. It was in the equity policy that we passed that it was going to be required, and I've never been told what that will be. And I know you're new, so <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not pointing fingers. Um, so, and then lastly, um, pushing the advanced coursework. I, I'm, a, I'm a huge believer in advanced coursework. We need to raise the bar for our kids, and they will, they will reach that bar. But I also believe that college isn't for everyone. Um, when we're talking about advanced coursework, are we considering like certifications and things like that, or is it strictly AP classes? This is this is access uh, an opportunity for all uh, avenues um, for whether that be employment, employment, enlistment, or or um, higher education. Okay, so when we're talking about advanced coursework and we're looking at the disparities. I can answer that. So each year, Teaching and Learning um, works on looking at the course catalog and determines which courses are advanced. So let's say, for example, Algebra 1 for a ninth grader wouldn't be advanced, but Algebra 1 for an eighth grader would be advanced. Okay. So that, that's defined in the course curriculum by Teaching and Learning. But what about like certifications, like certifications that, you know, we, we have a lot of students that receive certifications in, in place of, say, AP classes. Certifications might be a better avenue for others. So that's where the access comes in. And in some instances, some of our students aren't necessarily encouraged um, strategically to participate in some of the courses that offer the certification. So for example, if a student is, we focus on a student's strengths. So math may not be a student's strength, but they may be really good at uh, working with the hands or maybe art. And then that way uh, we can leverage that and encourage our uh, school-based counselors to encourage students to um, enroll in those courses that have certification so that if they do not choose to uh, go into uh, college or university and they choose a different track that requires a certification that they be encouraged to do so. So when we talk about um, encouraging and improving uh, student access and opportunity to advanced level coursework, it does include those certification courses. Okay, as well. that's great because I just I've heard from teachers before that sometimes they feel pressured to put to encourage kids to take AP classes when the teachers don't necessarily feel like they're ready to be able to show that they're taking advanced coursework but if there's other alternatives for for these kids to, to take it, it advanced might be different from what you know from one person to another sure. um, so I just want to make sure that we're not giving kids AP classes just to kind of boost our numbers that we're giving kids um, classes that meet their their needs sure and, and part of that um, conversation does um, start with uh, the academic and career planning and really looking at what a student is good at and really focusing on that question in terms of um, not just looking at ability, but what is a student good at and encouraging. So for example, um, we have you know our courses that are advanced level courses and the student may not necessarily choose to enroll in those unless they are encouraged to do so. Okay, so. great, great. So, but just to layer into that, I want to, so we don't, for sure don't put kids into like AP classes just to boost numbers, right? So one of the things you do want to look at though, and, and that's part of the data look, you know, the piece when you look at that is to say, okay, so in our certification courses, what is it, what does the student make up? In our advanced placement courses, what does the student make up? In our college level courses, what does the student make up? In our advanced art courses or arts, you know, classes, what does the student make up look like? And then try to understand like why that is, right? And so, no, we don't push kids in for the sake of pushing kids into, for example, college level courses. But if you look at your college level courses and it's disproportionately underrepresented with students, certain, certain student groups, right? We at least have to ask the question, why is that? Is it because they're not choosing? They, the, the, uh, uh, they, their caregivers and the students working together, the families and the parents and the students are saying, you're not going to college and you don't need those courses. Or is there something else there? And so I do think we owe it to our students to be looking carefully at that, just to, that, if that makes sense. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you for your focus on our econ economically disadvantaged students. I think that's so important, and I, I see that in here, and I think that that's going to be a great thing. So thank you for your hard work. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Mrs. Melnick. 
So eight years ago, we had 16 failing schools. And for the past six years, we've had zero. So I think it's fair to say that for the past eight years, um, this division has not had a difficult time having difficult conversations. I think that they've been going on. I think we have learned. I think that we have grown. Um, and I think that this work, really no offense, but it, it, it started a number of years ago and there was a lot of op opposition to that work. There were members of this board that did not participate in the equity study, I mean the equity um, survey that we, we all took. And it was, it was deep and it was confusing, um, but they held our hands and, and walked us through it. We had three members of this board that did not vote in favor of the equity policy. So I said it in the workshop that some of, some of this work really lies with this board and accepting this work and being a part of this work and sharing this work with the community. Um, you know, it, it, it's in here and we talked about this earlier and we heard it tonight from these students um, that one of our goals is to foster a sense of belonging and all of this matters, all of it. Um, um, I just thought it was important to note that, um, that this work began years ago. And just because there might be a few things in here that somebody likes now, all of this was in here from the beginning. Um, and some of us recognize that. So, so on, my comment is more on a macro level. Uh, I, I take a lot of pride and pleasure on, on behalf of this board in, in, in the strategic plan we have in place, Compass to 2025, and the fact that each of the six goals from the get-go, and this was this, this ad hoc group met in 2019, uh, myself and Mrs. Riggs were part of that ad hoc committee of 50 community stakeholders, but it was a really important discussion about where to place equity in that plan. And there were well-meaning people on both sides, but there was a discussion about, you know, do we, of making equity a sep its own goal. But then there was a growing sentiment pushed by many of us to have an equity emphasis attached to each of the six goals. And that was such a critical turning point for that ad hoc committee. And I feel, so for, for this plan, having a, an, an overall governing document, Compass to 25, was a perfect framework for you to draw, draw from, as you have. So we always say that we have a, we have a strategic plan to, that doesn't sit on the shelf. It's what governs the work we do, every presentation we have, the, our, our staff attach the subject at hand to which strategic goal it, it, it aligns with. And so just to see this in such close alignment with the intent of the strategic plan is, is a, great, a great step forward in my view, a great accomplishment. And, and so thank you. Mrs. Felton. Thank you, Chair. I appreciate that. And um, um, detailed report. Thank you so much. It's great to see movement. And I'm one to believe that, you know, sometimes just take policies and things uh, take, take a few time. My father, who was an uh, old evangelistic preacher, he used to say, you know, he said, I'm slow, but I'm show. So we move slow, but when we get there, we are sure about what we are doing. And I could ask a lot of questions on a lot of things in this report, but I just want to emphasize on one of the things that you mentioned here about um, student well-being. Go to, and it says, amplify students' voices through increased opportunities for leadership and input into school level. It is, and I, and I would read it all, but you know where I'm at, right? Yes, and it is all about the students. I do appreciate that. And when I go out to the schools, I immediately uh, talk with the principal, talk with some of the counselors or whatever, but I find me a group of students and I have a conversation with them as well. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised how many of them want to be a part of some of what we do. And I see that you said investigate the possibility of adding a student representative to the school board. 
And then you go in to establish a student equity council to be supported by division leadership. I like all of these that you have in here. And it's concerning our students. I could name a couple of groups that we already have in the school system that's working. And these, and these students are very um, phenomenal. We had a group of students come tonight and we hear them speaking you know what they can put forward. And, and before I would just murder their group name, I would just say, I hear the group names. They did mention their club's name. And I'm wondering, will we go inside and uh, make sure that we look at the groups that we already have within our schools Absolutely. to make them a part of this well-being for our students to give them that voice? And it is about the students. I want to stay focused on them as well. I was, yes, ma'am. Absolutely. In fact, it's, it's, it's in here. Uh, that's what we're going to do uh, because we know a lot of good things are happening in this division right. and um, I think it's just taking a deeper dive identifying what is happening mm -hmm. how we can leverage what is happening and in some cases how we can scale that up I agree and I just had to mention over the Ocean Lake they have a a huge very effective journalist group over there as well I had a meeting with them and they are really they, and they watch us at night the students and what's coming out of our meetings and what I get from them when I go to the school, they say, thank you, Ms. Felton, for all that you're doing. Just keep the resources coming in. And I appreciate that. And, and just the, before I give this up, uh, you talked about um, advanced classes now, students. And you know, I, I'm godly proud of most of the um, academies that we have. But there are limitations to the, those academies as for space, as for staff, and, and then a lot of things that's, that's that is not there that we want to push forward. So how do we keep uh, our other students that would would want to be in the in these academy, but not afford those um, those amenities to be in the academy? What are we doing about that? How are we reaching them in that in that equitable equitable way? Thank you, Mrs. Felton. So one of the things that we do very closely with our, our newest opportunity with the environmental studies program is we take a very close look at uh, who are the students that are applying for that program. And uh, this past year, Chris did an excellent job of brainstorming strategies, not only with his staff, but certainly with our staff at the Department of Teaching and Learning to do outreach and encouraging mm -hmm. those students to uh, actually apply. Some of it is um, a lack of knowledge about what the programs that we have that uh, are offered to encourage those students who don't typically apply for the programs that we have available to them um, that they may do so. So we are uh, very strategic in how we approach that and we will continue to look for opportunities to encourage those students who don't normally apply for some of our programs to certainly apply for them. And, and, and while I have your attention, uh, Dr. Rogers, you know, we talked about college, preparing our kids for college, career, military and i know that all students then they're, they're not or they won't strive to go to a four-year college but i do know that we have the advanced technology center that we get a lot of certificates for that because they go to the program every year and one year that we went we got over a thousand superintendent uh, last uh, last one pre-pandemic was thirteen thousand thirteen thousand certificates that went out of that one program so my my that was a, now that was across the city to be, that was, well, well, to be it, fair. but it was a lot across the city but it's still impressive mm -hmm. and our students were involved in that as well so i would ask you that we do have that going on when i go down to the when i get my invite to go down to the advanced technology i'm then all in it the auto classes and sniffing the paint and, and looking at all the nursing programs and all of the dental programs that they have, uh, you know, yeah, because I didn't put my mask on, Dr. Spence, but I'm coming out okay. But um, the last, the last program that they really implemented was the dental internship. It was impressive, and our students was leaving out of that program with jobs in a dental office. So I say to you, how will we? uh enhance that will that still be going or will we still get other programs coming in as well not just that but our nursing program our nurses that leave out of that advanced technology in that particular setting and i go to the nursing 
uh, program uh, graduation every year. And we have at least 10 to 20, 10 to 15 nurses that's coming out. And they're doing well. They have jobs already, or they're doing internship. This is every year that I go. And the only reason why we didn't have it was because of the pandemic. But last year, I went there. So how are we going to enhance this still growing program? How, are we going to, how much more can we do to that and make it look better and um, advertise it to other students? So thank you for asking that question. Um, Dr. Lockett is our um, director of our uh, TCE programs. And we continually look at opportunities to expand offerings and to fund some of the uh, offerings that we provide for our students and look for new offerings. Uh, as well as a matter of fact, we held a meeting today uh, to look at a, a potential grant to explore some of the um, opportunities for our students. So we always look for ways in which to expand uh, what we currently offer our students. And you're absolutely right. I'm on the advisory board as well. Yes. And uh, we're always talking about good things and getting more grants in. So it's good to hear that. And Dr. Lockett is excellent at the work that she does, especially picking up those students that want a career. And they move out. And it's really interesting. So I hope that we can enhance on that and let it become one of our brandings that we have with our students as well. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Academy nights this Thursday, the 13th. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. It's Academy night is, 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 is oh. this week, this Thursday. Yes, ma'am. 13th. 13th. Yeah. 13th. Yeah. 13th. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Shameless plug. Thursday yeah. the 13th. Yeah. Okay, we have we have a few more speakers in the queue. I just want to take 30 seconds out since Mrs. Fr uh, Felton brought up the the, uh, the student representative liaison to the school board just to remind the public or those not aware that uh, we've charged two of our school board members, Mrs. Ms. Owens, who's here this evening with us, and Ms. Mrs. Franklin. With they have they have been working this fall uh, in investigating this possibility, so that that is ongoing. And now we have Mrs. Anderson. Thank you. This is a, a definitely well-rounded. Uh, you can tell a lot of work has gone into it. Very transparent. Uh, and I agree uh, with Mrs. Rye. Uh, she indicated that Compass 25 was a good uh, such way to leading to many of these goals. However, these goals were actually developed because of the needs that, you, that we see in our division. The, and so it's very transparent that we, we have a lot of work to do yet. We know that, uh, but as as Ms. Melnick pointed out, we've come a long way since 2014, 2016, that time. We had four, 2014, since 2014, we've come such a long way, because we, we did, we had 16 schools not accredited, but we still have so far to go. And this points out, wow, we have a lot more to do in many of our equity areas. Uh, but this will improve our school division as much as Compass 2025. 20, I, I really, really feel like if we, if we can accomplish these goals, we would be far ahead of, of most divisions in the country. We, you know, so I appreciate the work that's gone into this, and, um, and thank you so much because I know that you stepped into this role and um, you've, you've taken over the reins, and um, we're going to get there. Thank you. If, if I may, uh, if, if you Google equity plans for schools, school divisions, you won't find many because so few have committed to doing this work at this level. They might have a statement or, you know, the remnant or the, the beginnings of a policy, but very few have um, committed. And so I, I thank you all, um, all of you um, for you know, your support and, and your conversations that I've had over the last month or so uh, with a number of you. Okay. I just want to say thank you to the students who stayed um, because, um, as you can see, some of this applies to what you were speaking to tonight. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Uh, Manning. Yeah, so one other thing I wanted to highlight is thank you so much for recognizing um, our students with special needs and making sure that they were included in this. Um, the, um, so the question that I have is, uh, it says VBCPS did not meet the state targets for including students with disabilities in the regular classroom for a specified period of time. And I don't know if this question can be answered right now, but maybe if we can 
kind of think about this as we're moving forward. Um, was the reason that they weren't included because parents didn't, the parents wanted them to be in self-contained um, and that was their choice? Or is it because we have not, you know, been, been putting them into the classroom? Because I have, I have many friends who have students with special needs who want their kids to be in inclusion classes as much as they can. But I also have friends who really want their kids to be in self-contained and they don't want them in the inclusion classes. So how much does that kind of play into this? And I don't know if you have an answer for me now, but maybe, you know, maybe that's something that we look at. So, um, and I'll just mention this because this is a, it's a state indicator and it's something we do have to submit a corrective action plan for. And so, um, it, yes and yes, right? <laughs> and so the yes is in all of the decisions about placement are made by the IEP teams and families and caregivers are engaged in those conversations. They're a part of the IEP team. The state looks at kind of a benchmark level of participation in, um, you know, inclusion in, in the inclusion model, and so we don't meet the benchmark. And what so so the yes is, you know, there are decisions that are made in the IEP team, but the yes is also we probably need to think about. And so one of those indicators in, in the plan says we're going to look at that on a school by school basis, and we need to think about the kind of guidance we're providing families in those conversations to make sure that we're at least meeting the state's benchmarks, but perhaps exceeding that because we know what the research says. It is really clear. The more students are with their regular education peers, the better they do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I, I kudos to the hard work that's been done um, in special ed. I, you know, I think we've really come a long way, um, but you know, obviously it's something we need to address. Thank you. Okay, Mrs. Melnick. Oh, oh, okay. That was old, it was crossed out, okay. So it appears that that's it for now, but uh, not not for you for now, because for you it's uh, just ongoing as it that's is for you. us. But thank thank you for uh, and to all my colleagues for a very engaging conversation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Second information item: state and federal accountability. The status of our schools. Mm -hmm. Hi. Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. Uh, I'm Scott Dunn. I'm a testing specialist in the Office of Student Assessment in Planning, Innovation, and Accountability. As you are aware, schools are accountable under two different systems. State accreditation, where each school is identified with an accreditation status, and federal accountability, where schools can be identified as needing assistance. Both systems come with their own sets of rules. This evening, I will present the 2022-2023 state accreditation ratings for Virginia Beach schools and share where our schools are regarding federal accountability requirements. We will start with state accreditation. As you are aware, changes to the state accreditation were approved by the Virginia Board of Education in 2017 and were put into action for the first time when determining state accreditation for the 2018 2019 school year. According to the Virginia Board of Education, they revisited their accreditation standards to provide a more comprehensive view of school quality while encouraging continuous improvements for all schools and placing increased emphasis on closing achievement gaps. The last time the Office of Student Assessment presented information related to state accreditation was in the fall of 2019 prior to the pandemic because the state waived accreditation for 2021 and for 21-22. For that reason, I will start this evening with a brief refresher of accreditation indicators and benchmarks. As a reminder, student achievement is no longer comprised of just passing SOL tests. It combines three success criteria, three success criteria to calculate a combined rate for English and math. The first success criteria is passing the test. For science, the pass rate is all that is calculated, but in the area of English and math, there are additional success criteria considered. For grades three through eight, reading and math, there is a second success criteria of student growth. Students who do not pass the reading or math test, but show growth based on established progress tables, count as successful. There is no SOL student growth applied for students in high school. Additionally, students identified as English learners who do not pass the reading test and do not show SOL student growth in reading, but show gains on their annual English learner assessment 
count as successful. Achievement data for reading and writing combined, math and science, are reported for students as a group. Reading and writing combined and math are also disaggregated by reporting groups. Remember that achievement for history is no longer part of the accreditation system. However, history is still required to be taught and assessed and is still a requirement for graduation. The accreditation system also includes chronic absenteeism, which is calculated for the all students group at each school. A student is defined as chronically absent if the student misses 10% or more, excused or unexcused, full days of the school year. Due to the impact of the pandemic has had on attendance, the Virginia Department of Education excluded chronic absenteeism from factoring in to the 22-2023 accreditation ratings. Now, high schools have additional state accreditation indicators, one of which is a graduation and completion index. This is a Board of Education approved formula that awards points based on a student's on-time completion status. On this slide, you will see the different completion types and the point values awarded for each completion type. And I'll pause for a moment. High schools also have a dropout rate indicator. Dropouts are students who discontinued schooling and have not earned a diploma, GED, or certificate of completion. These are students who are not enrolled in another public school, private school, or approved education program. Finally, for high school accreditation, there is a college, career, and civic readiness index indicator. This indicator represents the percentage of graduates who have received credit for advanced coursework or have earned a CTE credential and completed a CTE program of study or have participated in a service experience or a work-based learning experience. This portion of the accreditation system had been delayed due to the pandemic and will take effect starting with the 2023 graduating class, the 23-24 accreditation year. For each indicator, schools receive a performance level of one, two, or three. The performance level is calculated for a current year average and a three-year average, which even, whichever, whichever is higher is applied to the indicator. For 22-23 accreditation, the three-year average was based on 17-18, 18-19, and 21-22. This is two years of pre-pandemic data and this past year's data combined. Because accreditation was waived in 1920 and in 2021, data from these two years were not used in the three-year average. Level one indicates that a school's achievement on the specific indicator demonstrates performance at or above the benchmark or adequate improvement in the indicator as defined by the state. Level two indicates that a school's achievement on the specific indicator is below the performance benchmarks, but close to the range of measurement for level one or adequate improvement in the indicator as defined by the state. And level three indicates that a school's achievement is well below the performance benchmark. An indicator that is level two or three for four consecutive years automatically becomes a level three in the fifth year and stays there until the school achieves a level one status on that indicator. Okay. A school is accredited when all of their school quality indicators are in the level one or level two range of performance. Schools that are accredited but have an indicator at the level two range for the all student group are required to go through an academic review process that is monitored by the local school division. Any school that has a school quality indicator at a level two for a specific reporting group must implement a multi-year school improvement plan that will be monitored by the local school division. When a school has any school quality indicators identified as level three, the school is identified as accredited with conditions and is required to work cooperatively and in consultation with the Department of Education to develop a corrective action plan. 
When a school or school division fails to implement school division or school corrective action plans according to the plan timelines or has taken no action on identified strategies and intervention, the school is reviewed for potential designation by the board as accreditation denied. <clears throat> a school's accreditation is reviewed every year. However, once a school is accredited for three years in a row by meeting the established benchmarks, they enter triennial accreditation where they are accredited for three additional years. During that triennial accreditation cycle, if an accredited school does not meet a benchmark, they are expected to address the areas of concern through an academic review and or a school improvement plan with monitoring, which is overseen by the local school division. Because accreditation was waived for the past two years, those two years were not included in the three-year cycle. In the accreditation year prior to the pandemic, all VBCPS schools were in year one, two, or three of their three-year cycle or had just earned accreditation for their third year in a row to earn triennial accreditation. And for the 22-23 school year, all VBCPS schools are accredited. Absolutely. When we take a deeper look at how many schools receive certain performance ratings, we see that there were 59 schools that had final performance levels at level one for all indicators, which is 72% of our schools. Another 22 schools, or 27% of our schools, had final performance levels at level one and two for all indicators. Second, each elementary and middle school have 19 individual indicators they can meet, and even high school has 21 equaling 1,577 indicators division-wide. Our schools met the level one benchmark for 1,470 indicators, which is 93% of the indicators. This is very exciting news, but we still have a lot of work to do, and some of our schools will require additional assistance based on the ratings they received. Now, when looking at the accreditation indicators for the all students group, there were three elementary schools and one high school earning a level two rating in the area of science. One of our elementary schools earned a level three rating in science for all students. The elementary school with a level three indicator is also in year two of their triennial accreditation cycle and therefore has, the, um, has this year and next year to improve their science performance level. These schools will all undergo an academic review and a required school improvement process that will be monitored by the school division. There are two elementary schools, 11 middle schools, and six high schools that earned a level two in their English gap group indicator, and two elementary schools, six middle schools, and one high school that earned a level two in their math gap group indicator. These schools will also be involved in a required school improvement process that will be monitored by the school division. Although chronic absenteeism was waived for the 22-23 accreditation year, we recognize attendance continues to be a concern at our schools. We have 17 schools that would have been at a level two if chronic absenteeism would have been included in accreditation this year. Even though uh, including this indicator would have not affected any school's overall accreditation status, it is something that will be monitored closely and addressed. To address chronic absenteeism, each school will be required to monitor attendance, include goals and action steps in their plan for continuous improvement around their attendance data, and review their data, goals, and action steps and action steps at least monthly throughout the year. New reports are being developed to assist schools in these efforts. This past September, the Office of Student Support Services provided all schools with a new Student Response Team Attendance Support Plan, resources for chronic absenteeism, and a list of tiered interventions to proactively address compulsory attendance. Furthermore, through the work of our school board attorneys, and social, uh, school social work services beginning in January 2023, VBCPS will have a dedicated docket with the Juvenile and Domestic Relations Court to hear up to five truancy cases per month. As schools are closely monitoring attendance data, 
Multiple offices and departments will be available for support throughout the year. Now, in addition to accreditation ratings from the Virginia Department of Education, schools in Virginia are also held to federal accountability standards implemented as part of the Every Student Succeeds Act of 2015, also known as ESSA. Unlike the state system where ratings are assigned, the federal accountability system is used to identify schools across the state most in need of the additional support and monitoring. To help explain the data that are used to determine a school's level of support in federal accountability, I will compare federal accountability to the state accreditation indicators we reviewed earlier. State accreditation is summarized on the left of the chart uh, that you see on the screen, and federal accountability is summarized on the right. SOL scores are considered in both systems. State accreditation considers reading and writing combined and math and science while federal accountability only looks at scores in reading and math. State accreditation rates combine passing scores and student growth while federal accountability only reviews passing scores. English learner progress is embedded in state accreditation combined rates, but for federal accountability, this progress is a separate indicator. Academic growth is also embedded in accreditation combined rates. For federal, accountability, for federal accountability growth on SOL tests will be measured when determining schools who will be identified to receive support. While both systems look at reporting groups like special education and economically disadvantaged, state accreditation has a set benchmark of 70% for all groups in math and science and 75% for English, which is reading and writing combined. Federal accountability has interim benchmarks for math and reading, and they are different for each reporting group and for each year. Both systems do include a measure of chronic absenteeism and are calculated the same way. Both systems include graduation indicators. The graduation and completion index for the accreditation is a point-based system, and the federal graduation indicator calculates students who earn a standard, advanced, and IB diploma. Keep in mind, neither is calculated the same as the state's on-time graduation rate. State accreditation also utilizes the cohort dropout rate and a college career and civic readiness indicator for high schools that we discussed earlier, while federal accountability uh, does not consider either. Based on the data from the 2021-22 school year, none of the schools in the division have been designated for support or improvement under ESSA. Even though we did not have any schools designated as requiring support and improvement under ESSA, we did have several schools that did not meet the 95% participation rate required under ESSA. The VDOE's Office of School Quality requires that schools develop a plan which includes action steps for improving participation rates and monitor, uh, monitoring these steps. 17 schools did not meet the 95% participation rate. They included two elementary schools, four middle schools, and 11 high schools. In more than 75% of the cases where a group did not meet the participation rate requirement, the rate fell between 90 and 94 percent. Prior to the pandemic, almost all schools were meeting the 95 percent required participation rates on state assessments. The Office of Student Assessment will continue to review participation data with these schools and work with them to identify areas where improvements can be made. These schools will also address participation in their school improvement plan. As we celebrate the news of all schools being accredited and not being identified for support under ESSA, as well as many other successes in our division, will we remain focused on continuous improvement? Schools with level two and level three indicators, both academic and chronic absenteeism, will be working closely with division leaders throughout the year, and schools with a lower than 95% participation rate on state tests will address this in their plans for continuous improvement. 
Schools have drilled down into pass rate data and created data-driven goals and are working on implementing aligned strategies that focus on student success. They are engaged in teaching and assessing new content while simultaneously working to fill any gaps. They will adjust their improvement plans as data are collected and analyzed. Throughout the school year, central office staff will monitor goals and strategies, engage staff in aligned professional learning as needed, and provide the resources needed to assist schools in their work. And this concludes the presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I think some of us forgot how complicated some of this is. We were first presented with this pre-COVID, I believe, and this is like a refresher course for us. It is. Okay. Mrs. Owens. Yes, ma'am. Uh, do we have, uh, I know that on the uh, agenda items, there was a link to the uh, state site for the individuals, but do we have a report that gives us the individual schools in Virginia Beach that are referenced up here? Do we need to go to the state site and filter through? Um, I will look into that information and get back with you all. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, we know where to find you. <laughs> you sure do, it's a lot, so. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Very Thank good to you. See you. <laughs> and and now we have Mr. Delaney waiting in the wing, wings about a calendar adjustment. Uh, good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Meldick, members of the board, and Dr. Spence. The purpose of this informational item is to request an adjustment to both the 2022-23 calendar and the 2023-24 calendar. Uh, Ms. Rye, you challenged me. I did not include how this links to the strategic uh, plan or the strategic action agenda. So I do believe this fits in goal six around organizational effectiveness and also in the strategic action agenda around collaborative problem solving. And I hope I can there you go. show that for we, you in the presentation. We can check you off. Thank you so much. Uh, you may remember the 21-22 calendar did not include adjusted dismissal days for high school students uh, to complete exams and for schools to prepare for graduation. Uh, at the end of the year, we requested feedback from administrators and their teachers on the impact of not having those adjusted dismissal days. And um, as a result of that feedback, we're requesting that the 22-23 calendar be revised to include an adjusted dismissal for high school students beginning on Tuesday, June 13th through Friday, June 16th. This will allow for final exams to be completed in a distraction-free environment, as well as provide high school teachers with the time to grade the exams, finalize the grades, for students and allow our administrators to prepare for graduations. Uh, this will also, uh, adjustment will allow for graduation ceremonies to begin earlier in the day um, and not end as late during the week in some instances. Shifting to 23-24 calendar, we're requesting an adjustment. Currently Monday, March 4th is a staff day on the 23-24 calendar. We're qu requesting the staff day be moved to Tuesday, March 5th which is the date of the Super Tuesday in the presidential primary. Uh, the last presidential primary where both parties were involved was 2016. There were 91, according to our Office of Security and Emer uh, Emergency Management, there were 91,578 participants on that day, and we should expect a similar turnout in 2024. So we prefer to have our primary sites free of students on that day, thus requesting the shift to Tuesday the 5th. Uh, the second adjustment mirrors the request for this year as we would allow for the June 11th through June 14th to be utilized as adjusted dismissal days for high schools for the same reason. Just also want to note that transportation has been aware of that request and can accommodate that adjusted dismissal for those exam days. Um, at this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Yes, Mrs. Anderson. Thank you. I, 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 these are all adjustments that I, I, I agree wholeheartedly that needed to be made. Um, and, and I especially um, really like the fact that we we're, we're going to acknowledge that we have a lot of students in our schools on uh, what could have been an election day, and now uh, we won't have those students there on an election day. And I, I've always been opposed to having students in our schools when we have 
the general public coming in on a, on a regular basis on election day. So I think that's, that's the wisest, one of the wisest things we can do is make sure that and it, it, it just ensures a safe environment for that day. But I appreciate that. But the adjusted dismissals, I agree. Um, we've heard from a lot of our teachers who, from on the high school level, who felt like that that was really needed and they needed that time. So thank you. Appreciate that. Anybody with any questions for Mr. Delaney? Then we'll look we'll look for this on to a, a vote on next week next thank you. meeting. Okay. Thank you. And the final information item of the evening is our tri-campus update. And welcome, Dr. Janecki. I got it right this time? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Chairwoman Rye, Vice Chair Melnick, members of the school board, and Dr. Spence. I'm Dr. Heidi Janecki, Director of Research and Evaluation. This evening, Ms. Ingram, Executive Director of Facilities Services, and I will share an update on the tri-campus. Based on discussion at the July 18th school board retreat, the school division gathered community input on the tri-campus model before any design activities are started for the Williams Elementary School Bayside 6th grade campus building replacement project, as was done prior to the opening of Diamond Springs Elementary School in 2007-2008 when the grade levels were split across the three elementary schools in the tri-campus community campus model. I will provide a summary of the process used to gather input from the tri-campus community as well as the results. The purpose of the community outreach was to gauge the community's preference for the delivery model at the three tri-campus schools, the current delivery model with grade levels at separate schools, or kindergarten through grade five at all three schools when the new Williams replacement school is built. It was also communicated that both options would have Bayside sixth grade campus on site with the new Williams Elementary School. This was approved in the 2019-2020 Capital Improvement Program or CIP. Additional feedback was also solicited on any other items that should be considered with the replacement project. Following a review of the results, Ms. Ingram will provide information about the impact on the PPEA process and next steps. Community meetings and parent and staff surveys were used to gather input from the tri-campus community. The effort to gather input included parents and staff from all tri-campus schools and Bayside sixth grade campus. The community meeting and survey opportunities were advertised in several ways, including through emails to families and staff, paper flyers distributed to parents through the schools, a tri-campus information page on vbschools.com, and in some cases, a school marquee message. Next, I'll provide details about the community meetings and then the surveys. In total, four community forums were held in August and September. Three meetings were in person and one was virtual. In total, 17 community members attended the meetings where they were asked to provide input and their preference on the delivery model. Of those who provided a preference, two-thirds of the attendees preferred to keep the current delivery model, while one-third preferred to change the model to three K-5 to schools. Other input shared by participants during the community meetings focused on the perceived benefits and concerns for both delivery models. Regarding the current model, attendees noted that there is a sense of community at the campuses, that having the same age groups at each school helps with safety and comfort level, and that there is a focus on each age group at the schools. Concerns about siblings attending more than one school were noted. Discussion about changing to three K-5 to schools included the benefits of not moving across schools and siblings being at one school together. Concerns that were mentioned included having an equitable distribution of resources across schools, transportation, and large age gaps and mixing of grade levels at the schools. Surveys of parents and staff were also conducted in September at the Tri-Campus Schools and Bayside 6. Parents were informed about the survey through a flyer sent home with students and a division email message. Multiple methods were used for the parent survey to maximize the response rate. Parents received an email invitation as well as a paper copy of the survey distributed through their child's school. The online survey included a Spanish translated version for parents to access and the online survey was also able to be translated by website browsers. Overall, 727 parent surveys were submitted for a 44% response rate. 
staff received an email invitation for the survey with multiple reminders and school administrators were asked to announce and remind staff about the survey opportunity. The staff response rate was 41%. The next slides will provide the survey results which were consistent with the information learned from the community forums. This slide provides information about the group of parents who responded to the survey. Overall, there were similar percentages of parents who indicated they had a child at Diamond Springs, Newtown, and Williams, while a smaller percentage of parents indicated they had a child currently attending Bayside 6. Overall, 66% of parents expected to have children enrolled at a tri-campus school or Bayside 6 in fall 2025, which is the earliest that families would be impacted by the replacement school. In addition, to gather information about families' experience with transitioning between the tri-campus schools or Bayside 6, parents were asked if they had a child move from one school to another. A majority of respondents indicated that they had a child transition between the schools. Overall, 53% of parents who responded to the survey item indicated they preferred the current delivery model. Approximately 24% preferred a K-5 to model for all schools, and 24% indicated they did not have a preference. The preferred model was the same regardless of the school selected, although percentages varied somewhat. Parents with younger children at Diamond Springs or Newtown only were somewhat more likely to indicate they preferred the current delivery model. Parents with children at Williams or Bayside 6 were somewhat more likely than other parents to indicate they did not have a preference. Additionally, results showed that parents' experience with students transitioning between schools did not change the pattern of results. 58% of parents who indicated their child transitioned between schools preferred the current delivery model. Parents were offered the opportunity to provide any additional feedback or suggestions they had about the delivery model for the schools. Comments were provided by 13% of the parents, and responses were analyzed for common themes based on their preferred model. Of those who wanted to maintain the current delivery model, parents discussed three common themes. First, they liked that the current model allowed their students to learn and interact with students that were developmentally similar. Second, parents commented that the current model helped them feel a sense of safety and security because their students were interacting with students their own age and they were not exposed to older students or potential bullying. Finally, parents noted that one of the challenges of the current model was having multiple children at multiple schools with varying start times and different buses. Parents in this group mentioned this as more of an inconvenience rather than a reason for changing the model. Of the parents who wanted the delivery model to change to, to a K-5 to model at each school, parents reported challenges with the multiple transitions the students experience among the schools, which they viewed to be a lack of stability or continuity. Parents commented that it was difficult for their students to adapt to new learning environments with new routines every few years. Second, parents discussed challenges with having multiple children at multiple schools as a reason for changing the delivery model to K-5. to To gather feedback on parents' experience with key aspects of the tri-campus model, parents were also asked to rate their satisfaction with several areas noted in the chart. Results were very positive with 92 to 95% of parents who provided a rating indicating they were satisfied or very satisfied with the various components. Additional analyses showed there was little variation when comparing satisfaction percentages for parents who indicated they had a child who transitioned across schools and those who had not. For the survey item asking about the transition process when students progress to the next grade level and move between schools, it is noteworthy that 92% of all parents, as well as 92% of parents who indicated they experienced transitions, were satisfied. Moving to the staff survey results, this slide shows characteristics of the 124 staff members who responded. Approximately a third of staff indicated they worked at Diamond Springs or Williams, while 17% of staff indicated they worked at Newtown or Bayside 6. The majority of staff, 69%, who responded to the survey were instructional staff. About half of staff indicated they have worked five years or less at their school, and about half indicated they have worked more than five years at their school. 90% of the staff who responded expected to be working at the schools in fall 2025, the earliest any potential change could impact them. 
In alignment with the parent responses, the pattern of results showed a preference for the current delivery model at the tri-campus schools. Overall, 63% of staff respondents preferred the current delivery model, 28% preferred the K-5 delivery model at all schools, and 9% had no preference. This slide shows results by staff group. Although percentages preferring the current model varied by staff respondent group, the pattern remained the same with the majority of each group preferring the current model. In addition, 70% of staff who worked at their school more than five years and 56% of staff who worked at their school five years or less preferred the current model. Staff were also offered the opportunity to provide any additional feedback or suggestions and 35% provided a comment. Staff who wanted to maintain the current delivery model discussed three common themes. First, staff felt as though the current model allowed them to focus on providing targeted and specialized instruction to the age-specific group of students in their building. Second, staff noted there is strong co collaboration among teachers within the schools, and some mentioned there was strong collaboration among the three schools. Finally, staff, particularly those at Diamond Springs, mentioned that the school is specifically designed for students in grades K to one rather than older students. Staff who wanted the delivery model to change to a K-5 model, similar to parents, cited challenges with the multiple transitions the students experience among the schools, which they viewed to be a lack of stability for the students. Second, some staff felt that due to student mobility at the tri-campus, their tri-campus experience was not as intended with enrollment across all the schools. Finally, some staff noted there were inconsistencies among the instructional strategies across the three schools that they thought would be improved if all the grade levels were in the same building. To gather additional information about staff members' experience at the schools, staff were asked the extent to which they agreed or disagreed with multiple statements about the sense of community, collaboration, and transition process. Results for all staff are shown in blue and results for instructional staff are shown in orange. Overall, at least 70% of all staff agree that students feel valued and are offered a sense of community and that teachers have access to quality collaboration sessions and support from colleagues and content specialists. From 56 to 66% of all staff agreed that there is a sense of community across the tri-campus schools, collaboration across schools is effective, and that students trans transition effectively across schools. For all survey items, instructional staff had lower agreement percentages compared to all staff respondents. Perceptions of the various programs and opportunities offered at the schools were positive. At least 85% of all staff agreed that specialized programs and services for students, concentration of teaching strategies appropriate for the age groups, and specialized professional learning are offered. Instructional staff also had positive perceptions with at least 81% agreeing with the survey items. Based on the consistency of the results showing a preference for the current model from the community forums, the parent survey, and the staff survey, we believe the implication is to continue with the plan to design and build Betty F. Williams as a grade four to five school with the site to include Bayside sixth grade campus. At this time, Ms. Ingram will provide information about the project and next steps. Good evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you, Dr. Janicki. Um, looking at this data and considering, um, next slide, please. Um, looking at this data and con um, concerning facilities planning, on this slide we have the planning sheet for Williams Elementary School, Bayside sixth grade campus, replacement project, capital improvement program 1 028. First introduced in the CIP in school year 1920 with Bayside sixth grade replacement school as well on site with the new replacement school for Williams Elementary. With this project now approved and money being appropriated to it, the community outreach was initiated by the school division in order to get feedback from the community on this delivery model. This was um, done prior to any design taking place in order to ensure that the school is getting designed to meet the community needs. Currently, as programmed, the replacement building will be designed for grades K through for grades four through five, with Bayside sixth grade campus on site. The replacement building will be roughly 145,000 square feet to accommodate these students. Optimum capacity of the building will be 950 students, 
with grades four through five having a capacity of roughly 500 students and grade six having a capacity of roughly 450 students. Based on the survey results reviewed from the community input this year, we are not recommending any changes to this already approved CIP project. Uh, so looking at some next steps, um, October 18th, which is a week from today, um, City Council is scheduled to take action on the PPEA interim agreement, which would start the design process for the replacement school as early as this fall. If approved, the school division will begin design charrettes this fall winter 2022 with current planning guidelines we just reviewed as originally proposed with the CIP project in the 1920 CIP. If the PPA interim agreement is not approved, staff will work with the original schedule in the CIP with design starting as early as school year 24-25, again, with the same guidelines we've just reviewed. At this time, we're available to answer any questions. Uh, I think I'm just missing something obvious. I'll start here. The optimal capacity. Mm -hmm. So we have two grades, four to five, 500 plus, and one grade, Bayside six at 450. Why isn't it proportional? So um, our middle school, that's okay. Our middle school attendance zones are much larger than our elementary attendance zones. So, uh, the tri campus mm -hmm. attendance zone is unique. Yep in that it has three schools embedded in one attendance zone. So it is much larger than our normal attendance zones. However, that is the reason Bayside Middle School um, does have more students at one grade level than the two at tri-campus due to the size of the attendance zone. So I said I'm probably missing something obvious. Okay. Thank you. Yes, okay. that's okay. <laughs> okay, Ms. Owens. Thank you. I don't know how much of a, of a question it is, maybe just a, a Maybe it's a question. Maybe it's a comment. Um, when I'm looking at the uh, input from the community, I think it's obviously very important for us to weigh heavily the uh, wants of the families attending these schools. Um, on the other side, I think it's important that we just had the uh, update about accreditation and to note that we only have one school in our district that has accreditation with a waiver, and it's one of these three schools. And these are the only schools that we are doing in this format. And so it does bring to question if we only have one school that is uh, at that status, and these are the only group of schools that we are doing differently, where there are these multiple transitions where parents have talked about difficulty transitioning, where we just got a whole, uh, presentation about relationships and stability and how that impacts achievement, I think it's something that, at least as a board, we, we need to be making whatever decision we make with that in mind. I don't know if parents, when they were doing the survey, were told out of all the schools in our district, one of these three is the only one that's accredited this way, and these are the only ones that we're doing in this manner to have them weigh that. Um, I'll, also, I'll also pass it to Dr. Jenicky, but um, at all community meetings, we did have um, 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 school um, performance indicators that we shared with the community, um, both there and then online at our virtual meeting as well. So um, they did take a look. It was very similar to the information that was shared with the school board at your retreat um, for that information. So the, the community was aware um, of their um, performance indicators. Were they aware of the performance indicator, I guess, in comparison, like did they know out of the district, this is the only one? That was not included on the survey um, directions, no. Okay. It was based on their experience. Okay, thank you. Hi, hey, can you clarify uh, just real quick? So. It is one of the tri-campus schools that has the level three indicator, which is what I would think she's talking about, but they're not accredited with the waiver. They're under the triennial accreditation. Is that correct? Right. And so we have an opportunity to look at improvement there and see what happens. 
that's a science indicator for them, and mm -hmm. um, that's because four or five is where you, you where you take that. Um, and so, it isn't necessarily. I mean, I understand your point. It's it's well taken. You're also talking about one of the most the, the highest poverty school sure. in the community. There's a lot. You're talking about the massive impact of COVID on that community mm -hmm. and a lot of other things. And so I would say to point to that and say, well, it's the model that created this problem. I think, mm -hmm. I mean, I understand your point, but I think there are other challenges there. Agreed. And I'm not sure it's the model that's creating the challenge. And so I think the input weighs in to say, how does it impact you as a family? I think we do want to take that into account. So mm -hmm. let me just say this. So I'm not, I'm not certainly not trying to be defensive about that. No. What I'm saying is we did consider that in our conversations around this before we brought you a recommendation, because we know that was part of the original conversation of why we went out and had these community meetings was to say, is it working? Mm -hmm. And um, if it's not working, should we do something different? But our, our feeling is it is, um, it is important that the, we understand how the community feels about it why it was put into place in the first place and you know ultimately understanding that there are challenges in that tri-campus community that don't exist in some of our other school communities and so i don't want i want to make sure we're not you know doing apples to apples or we are doing apples to apples comparisons so. i agree and um if i misspoke it's just the uh, state site has it listed as accredited by three-year waiver and so maybe that means that triannual uh whatever mm -hmm. the correct wording for that and just reading the words on the, the screen of the yes. video -y. and I think it's important to, to recognize that there are lots of factors that play into it and we do need to like I said weigh heavily the uh, community feedback but we want to make sure that as a board that we are considering all the factors that we're aware of and that I'm not sure how those factors were presented to the community versus um, what we're seeing so Mrs. Anderson. I just wanted to point out that this particular um, situation was put into place because there was a need to do something for that area of schools. A great need at the time. And so um, I can't tell you exactly what the scores were back then, but I can tell you that there was a need and that's why this whole, this whole tri-campus thing came to be. They needed to make some changes major to help the community and help those students. And so we have come a long way in helping to bring up the scores and the achievement of the students in, the, in that particular area. That's why that tri-campus situation was set up to begin with. And I, I, I just talked to somebody recently who was in on who part, part of the administration when we, when we went to that tri-campus, and, and, and they were adamant that that's the reason why we needed to give help. And this was the, one of the solutions they came up with to help achievement in, those, in that area. So just wanted to point that out. Yes, there's a difficulty now, but if we hadn't done this, I can't, I can't even imagine how bad it would have been had, it, had we not done this tri-campus thing. So just want to let you know that. Anybody else? Ms. Williams. Yeah. Um, Yes, I was on the board, obviously, at that time, and um, Ms. Anderson is correct, and we had some very passionate debates at that time. It was not an easy process, um, and we had differences of opinion up here on the dais, but the community needed help, the schools needed help, and after much, much, much planning and thoughtfulness and much community input, much debate between the 11 of us, we decided that this was the best best avenue forward. And um, I feel so much more comfortable moving forward after we've gotten this input. So I thank, thank Dr. Spence and the board for deciding to get the input at our retreat because, um, you know, it's pretty clear now. And, um, you know, before we spent money on the addition and everything, we needed to make sure that, um, 
you know, we got the community input, and thank you so much for reaching out after I, I, I was very concerned when you had them in, in August, you know, and so I know you had multiple and you had the virtual one, so um, that made me feel a lot better. And I'm, I'm not sick, I just have really bad allergies, guys. <laughs> so I just wanna make sure that I'm, I'm not contagious, that's right. <laughs> I don't feel well, but it's just allergies. That's why I haven't spoken much today. But I did want to thank everybody for um, for the input, and I know the community appreciates that, and, and um, we all do as a board. So I, I feel very comfortable moving forward. Thank you. I guess I think that settles it, covers it. Uh, so we will. Uh, Will there be formal staff notification to the school board of this? I mean, obviously, we all know we can track school city council meetings, but I think it would be appropriate maybe to come up with a plan to officially notify the board of, of the city council action and what that means for us one way or the other. Is that fair? Yes, ma'am. We'll do that. We'll make the, after they take their vote, you'll get a full uh, update probably by memo on their vote and then what our next steps will be. Okay, thank you. Okay, the consent agenda portion of the meeting. I will go ahead and read the items. A, easement agreement, Achievable Dream Academy Edition to Lynn Haven Middle School, Dominion Energy easement agreement. And two under that is the John B. Dye easement agreement. B is the recommendation of general contractor for SeaTac, Linkhorn Park, and Newcastle Elementary Schools boiler replacements. C is the list of policy review committee recommendations you see here, uh, 17 of them. Policy 363, safety weapons on school property. Two is policy 522, teacher removal of students from class for disruptive behavior. Three is policy 523, students over 20. Four, policy, four, number four, policy 524, dropouts, prevention, intervention, and retrieval. Number five, policy 542, property damage. Number six, policy 5-55, health services and the health services manual. Number seven is policy 5-57, medications. Number eight is policy 5-60, toxic art materials. Number nine, policy 563, early dismissal, leaving school grounds. Number 10 is policy 565, search and seizure. Uh, number 11, policy 5-68, sex, sex offender registry notifications. Number 12 is policy 5-70, employment counseling and placement services. Number 13 is policy 5-72, student photographs, class rings, and other sales. Policy number 14 is policy 5-75, indigent students. Number 15, policy 6-23, curriculum documents. Number 16, 5-52, class size. And finally, uh, number 17, policy 6-73, testing and assessment. So that covers the policies. And then finally, we have consent ag agenda item D, religious exemptions. So with that, a motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs, a second. Mrs. Anderson, all in favor, show a raised hand. Ms. Hughes, how do you vote? It looks like Ms. Hughes is not online, so Madam Chair, there are eight ayes. The motion passed. Thank you, Madam Clerk. And finally for action is the personnel report and administrative appointments. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, motion to approve. Mrs. Riggs and a second, Ms. Owens. All in favor, show a raised hand. We have eight ayes, the motion did pass. Thank you. So with no one to introduce tonight, we'll go to Agenda item 16 and who would uh, a committee organization and board reports. So who would like to s start? 
with that. Well, maybe I will then. Uh, <laughs> so I, again, I mentioned in the workshop, I'll mention it again here on behalf of the Virginia Beach Education Foundation, uh, happy to announce the uh, House Project Groundbreaking Ceremony uh, thurs this Thursday, October 13th. Uh, and the new address, the address for this, I think it's House Project number 13, if I'm not mistaken, since the inception of the foundation, is at 1512 Indiana Avenue. So we'll have a representation of board members attending that. And uh, this is very much a student-focused uh, project. 1215. Uh, and if anybody's interested in other dates uh, for teachers, grant deadline, uh, innovation learning only, I'm not sure what that means, but that's October 14th. Uh, we have the be another beach, a beach bags food drive on October 27th at Pembroke Square and schools, and that will be pretty much all day. Uh, the, and I'll end it with the end of this calendar year for now. The TGIF celebration, that's where we celebrate the teachers and their benefactors for their grant proposals, uh, will be December 8th, 5.30 to 8 at the Sandler Center. So the Education Foundation continues to do great work. A lot of good new faces. We, there was the first in-person board meeting that I had the pleasure of attending uh, in September. Uh, and uh, a lot of good, not good young faces too. You know, young young uh, citizens uh, and some parents with young children in the schools, in addition to other longtime uh, citizen members. So I think the board is is very representative of our community, and so there's that. And as far as governance committee. Uh, we got an update on the, uh, the legal services department that keeps proceeding. And uh, the last hiring is, is, in, is going to be in place by the end of October is the prediction of, of the, another a paralegal. So that will take care of the, uh, the staff ca capacity. And uh, working on the case management system, getting that in place, that's a work in progress, but ma making good progress. And uh, let's see, I was also going to mention the uh, protocols manual. There was discussion on that. And uh, the, so the decision was, you know, that's been, that continues to be updated as these bylaws and policies get updated. And because of the frequent <laughs> nature of that, it will be an electronic manual, which just seems to make sense and be in alignment with, uh, with other documents that are subject to frequent change. Uh, Holland Road Annex transition, it was superintendent shared at the committee meeting. Um, staff here in the building are beginning to pack up. Uh, most likely after Thanksgiving would be the, the official transition. And we're looking at the first school board meeting to be either the December meeting or the first, the organization meeting in January as the first school board meeting in the, uh, the present Holland Road Annex. And again, for the public's benefit while this building goes, undergoes major renovation. Any, and uh, I think those are the, the Key, the key points. Did I miss anything? Okay. Okay, Mrs. Riggs. Okay, um, for the policy review uh, committee, we will be starting with the bylaws this coming Thursday. So there are lots of them on there to begin with. So uh, that goes along with the protocols too. You know, if, if there's any changes, which Mrs. Linetti has continuously made sure that they have been updated as we've gone along anyway. Um, so that will be started. Uh, this coming um, Thursday. Also for Sister Cities, um, we were at Phil Fest this past weekend. And the reason I want to mention that is because this was our first, uh, our youth ambassador, our new youth ambassador for this year, her first chance and opportunity to be able to, to be seen and to speak. And she did speak at um, the Phil Fest. She is just an amazing young lady. She is in the entrepreneur uh, business academy and wow what a great representative she is she's just ready to move and go she's going to go places that this this girl's a great representative of ours and um i'm just so amazed with her when her talent was um 
she gave a speech and she talked about what her project was and her entrepreneurship is. And she ended up meeting somebody at the Phil Fest that is working with entrepreneurship. We got his car too. Um, uh, so they had a great conversation going and she was very uh, excited about that. But I thought I'd share that with you guys too, because I think you might want to see that Dr. Spence. Um, anyway, she's just a great representation of the many students we have in the school system. Just amazing young lady. Thank you. This is Melanie. And just a reminder, the audit committee will meet um, on the 26th at 1 o'clock, and that we did move that back a day, so 26th at 1 o'clock. And you did not mention what time PRC is meeting. 11 o'clock. 11. Okay. All right. It, it appears that covers it, and we have uh, finished our business for this evening. So uh, safe travels home and for everybody, and this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.